Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this new talk about leadership at Google. I'm extremely honored and also grateful to receive our guest. He was the, the first speaker on the first day of the executive MBA program at Columbia. And uh, 20 months later, was voted by, uh, was nominated by the students to be the keynote speaker at the graduation ceremony. I think that says something about his uh, talent as a speaker. His class, High Performance Leadership, is uh, consistently one of the best ranked, if not the highest ranked, uh, class at Columbia Business School. Um, he spent 20 years at Pepsi as Chief People Officer. He loves uh, cashmere and good wine. Please uh, welcome Professor Feiner. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here. It's nice to see such a large crowd when uh, today is opening day for the New York Mets. Um, uh, for folks in uh, Kirkland or, or Mountain View or Seattle, that's a baseball team. Uh, uh, so I, I want to talk to you for a bit about leadership, uh, and I've been instructed to advise you that to hold your questions until the end, and then uh, I will be eager to answer what I hope are questions as provocative of some of the comments I'm going to make uh, today. Um, I have a lot of passion for the subject of leadership. Uh, and I would wager that uh, anybody who works in organizational life has a, an opinion about leadership. If you ask people to name great leaders, often you hear the names uh, Churchill, uh, for David I'll say Napoleon, uh, Martin Luther King, JFK, and that's largely because when we think of great leaders, we think of visible leaders, uh, leaders that we've either read about or talked about as kids. It's the way we're socialized as children. The fact is that leadership is really like an iceberg. 90% of it is hidden below the surface. It's the things that we don't see day in and day out that determines whether people are effective in getting things done in organizations. It's not about necessarily being a valiant, courageous, heroic individual, the way we typically associate uh, Napoleon or JFK or Churchill or Lincoln or so forth. Uh, and the fact is that uh, we all have opinions about leadership. Uh, but I think it's important to review quickly, in my opinion, what leadership is not about. Uh, I don't think leadership is about grand strategy. Uh, that may sound surprising for an organization like Google, who I suspect is grappling now with what is the business model over the next five to ten years. What is the right strategy? And, in fact, you're probably aware that you have some folks from McKinsey running around trying to help you sort that out. Now, I think strategy is important for any business, but I think the tough part of strategy is not formulating it, it's implementing it. The tough part of strategy is getting people, all you Googlers, to figure out what is the strategy, to buy into the strategy, to believe in the strategy, to row on the oars in the same cadence, in the same rhythm, so what, what I'm suggesting here, the tough part of strategy is strategy implementation, not strategy formulation, especially difficult in an organization like Google, which has grown from 300 people five years ago to 20,000. I don't think leadership's about personal charisma. I, I, I said another way, I think leaders come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, some are short, some are tall, some dress for success, some don't, some are modest and self-effacing, some have big egos. I think leadership practices ultimately determine whether or not someone is charismatic, not the reverse. I don't think leadership is about inspiring oratory. Uh, I haven't seen or heard 
uh, your famous three make speeches, Eric, Larry, Sergey. I don't, I don't know, but my having been around organizational life for many, many years uh, before I started teaching, uh, I think there's very few people in organizational life who match JFK and Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Churchill or so forth. And finally, I don't think leadership is about technical skills. I mean, you're all very smart. Google is famous for having very smart people and a hiring process that makes it foolproof that you'll be hired only if you're very smart. But the fact is, um, I don't think leadership's about being the smartest man or woman in the room. It's quite likely you, you who manage groups of people may have people working for you who are more technically expert. I think very often leadership is about, about being, from time to time, a curator or a conductor, as opposed to the smartest, most technically expert, functionally expert person. So if that's not what leadership about is about, then obviously it must be about accurate planning and budgeting. It must be about sound organizing and staffing, particularly important the larger and larger organizations like Google, Google becomes. And finally, it must be about effective tracking or controlling and problem solving. That is tracking how you're doing against the operating plan and then of course, problem solving or making adjustments on the fly when in fact things like the Great Recession beset us. Now all of those things are important, but particularly important because they add order and consistency and predictability to an organization, something that I'm told Google has fight very hard to resist. But the fact is, as important as order and consistency and predictability are, it's really what management is about. And I think management's important for every organization. Being well managed is important, whether you're Google or AT&T. But if that's the only thing you're good at, you ultimately become the Department of Motor Vehicles. You become bureaucratic, a lot of red tape, a lot of policies, a lot of procedures, a lot of rules which can be very unhealthy for any organization. So therefore, it's very important to offset management with leadership. And what leadership is about is really establishing direction. Whether you're running a department or not, whether in fact you have a department or not. Establishing direction for me is about the vision and the strategies to get there. It's also about building alliances and coalitions so the product management people and the engineers and the sale, sales people actually focus on the prize instead of fighting with one another, which can occur in any organization. And finally, day in and day out, once you cut through the game rooms and the free candy, how excited are you about your jobs and about coming to work here and about collaborating with the people in the next cubicle. That motivating and inspiring is one of the hardest things to do in organizational life. One, to, for yourself to be motivated and bring your A game every day, and then to make sure that you can get the people that you're collaborating with, or in fact supervising or managing, to make sure they bring their A game. It's hard to do. Next to raising teenagers, which I've done four times, Motivating and inspiring people every day is very difficult. I don't know about the people in California or Washington, but if you take the subway, the New York City subway to work every day, which many of you do, and you look around at the misery on the faces of the people, <laughs> you get a sense that people aren't terribly motivated and inspired about going to work. It's actually quite tragic. Not so funny. So if management is about predictability and consistency and order, then leadership is about change and adaptability. An organization like Google in the space you're in has to be particularly adaptable given the technology 
and how quickly it changes in this space, adaptable to new technology, new competitors, new regulation, new competitive responses, new customers. So effective organizations are both well-led and well-managed, which means your challenge is to be concerned about order and consistency and predictability more than you have been in the past, in my opinion, but at the same time worried about vision and the strategies to get there and motivating and inspiring people to bring their A-game to work. So how do you do that? I think the thing that's particularly important with leadership is building followership, particularly when this is such a high transaction collaborative organization, influencing people, not relying on sanctioned power and authority requires you to influence and persuade. So leadership, in my view, is really about building followership. It's really about pulling people. It's much less about the use of power and much more about the empowerment of others. It's really about taking people with you. And all of that is about managing relationships. It's about managing relationships down in the organization. It's about managing relationships up in the organization, sometimes with knucklehead bosses. And particularly important here at Google, it's about managing collaborative peer relationships. And all of that takes HTHC. All of that takes hand-to-hand -hand combat. That is, it's all of those hundreds of transactions you have every day, up, down, and across. It gets people to do what you think they need to do. That's really what leadership is about. Leadership has nothing to do with your title, as you know. It has nothing to do with your sanctioned power and authority. It has to do with influencing and persuading people to do what you feel deeply is important to the success of this organization. That's why oratory and strategy and charisma won't help here. This is why leadership is just like an iceberg, right? 90% of it is hidden below the surface. So I, I want to talk to you about tactically, very real world setting. How do, how do you lead people to excel? And uh, just as context, um, I wrote a book uh, several years ago called the, the Finer Points of Leadership, uh, where there are 50 laws or rules or principles that you could use to motivate and inspire people every day. And uh, I, I'm not going to go through 50 laws because you'd be throwing tomatoes at me by the, by the 20th, but I'd like to go over 10 laws that I think you can use immediately after this session, and I think it would enhance your effectiveness. Um, law number one. This is not a typo. This is meant to add drama here, so don't... <laughs> Don't get nervous for me. I, my slides are going to, they're okay. Uh, this law can best be explained by telling you a true story. 1968 California School District. And teachers are told that certain third graders have scored very high on a late bloomer test and, expecting, and to expect a learning spurt over the ensuing school year. Lo and behold, at the end of the school year, not only did these third graders improve their performance in the classroom, but their IQ scores went up. Quite dramatically, quite unexpectedly, their IQ scores went up. Surprising? There was no test. It was a ruse. It was a ploy. It was an experiment 
now known as the Pygmalion experiment between this very well-known social psychologist of the day and this California school district. What happened? Teachers were told to expect a learning spurt. And so as a result, gave these third graders who purportedly scored high on this late bloomer test, they gave these third graders more time, more attention, more focus, and more feedback. And these third graders receiving this increased focus and attention and coaching improved their performance in the classroom. This is what I call the law of expectations. In my parlance, what that means is when we expect people to succeed, they usually do. So let me say it another way. People respond to the level of confidence you show in them. I would suspect that in your own lives, given how successful and how smart you are, this had an enormous impact because I would suspect this is the way you were parented. The fact is, however, this is an important attitude or mindset to have, particularly in a collaborative relationship where you need ultimately to expect people to meet or exceed your expectations because if you have people working for you in some cases who don't, they know it regardless of what you tell them. It's in the ether. It's in the oxygen. So if you have some concerns about people's ability to meet or exceed your expectations, you better make sure because you are a leader that you provide the teaching and enabling that's required so that in fact they do ultimately have your confidence. Law of intimacy. It's always amazing to me when I go into organizations where I do a fair amount of consulting and very often leaders will say, you know, I'm not happy with my team and I'd like you to talk with my people to sort out how I can raise my game, how I can groove my team. And I talk with the people who work for this leader, and the single biggest complaint I get is, my leader has no idea who I am, what I'm about, what I stand for, what my hot buttons are. So the law of intimacy is all about, yes, being focused on the task, being focused on the responsibilities, being focused on the to-do list, but to lead people effectively, you have to know your people. That doesn't mean just understanding the names of their spouse or their children or their pet. That might be interesting. What's more important is sorting out how to get the best out of them. Well, do they like a long leash, a short leash, a lot of independence, a lot of transactions? You know, I have four children. The idea of treating them exactly the same is preposterous. Yet when I talk to leaders, they tell me, listen, I, I hear you, Mike, but I treat, I, I understand the law of intimacy because I treat everybody the same. This is a very famous, uh, this is a very important academic concept. Uh, you may want to write this down. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> you ought to be treating everybody differently because everybody is different, particularly in a place like Google, which prides itself on being such an iconoclastic culture. I mean, the fact is, it's really important to treat people equitably, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to treat them similarly. Law building a cathedral. You all know, Jobs aren't enough for the soul. Everybody, especially the people I see on the New York City subway, need to feel that meaning and purpose is connected with the work they do. And that's important because unless you think you're building a cathedral, you think you're chopping stone, and no one wants to chop stone. So I think it's important for leaders in this organization, which means everybody who works in it, to make sure they understand whatever their role, whatever their job, 
whether they're an engineer involved in very nitty gritty things or not, ultimately connecting people is changing the universe and that cathedral can compensate for sometimes the maybe boring or repetitive work that people are doing. Law of personal commitment. This is real simple. Everybody knows that you as an individual is committed to doing your work and meeting your targets. But you have to be committed to not just your success, your targets, your to-do list, your role and your responsibilities. It's about having some share of mind for the concerns and success of the people who work for you and or the colleagues you deal with every day. You're going to get a lot less trust if people think the only thing you care about is your success and your targets. This is about answering emails on time. This is about doing performance reviews on time. This is about actually being available to teach when people have a question. Law of accountability. Yes, you have to be concerned about your targets. But it seems to me, for accountable people to own it, they have to have a performance contract with the people who they are going to depend on to get their work done. It can be on a back of an envelope, but the, the, the performance contract needs to be very clear and very specific about what are the requirements that you expect people to meet for you and what they need from you that can enable them to satisfy your expectations. But in a place like Google, where collaborative relationships are so intense and so multifunctional, I think it's very important to understand the law of pull versus push. Yes, you all have strong points of view, and therefore it's quite normal for you to want to persuade and influence peers to accept your point of view. And there's nothing wrong with that, except if that's the only technique you use. Ultimately, it seems to me, you need to not only try to persuade and influence and assert your point of view, which all of you pride yourself on doing quite openly, it seems to me you also need to involve and listen and engage. It might be interesting to kind of blend with the push approach, the pull approach, which requires as a first question, help me understand why you feel that way. And in fact, throughout your work, you ought to be using both pull and push. If you're using ultimately just push, like I did for a good part of my career, people know the pitch you're going to throw. They know the technique of influence and power and assertiveness. And ultimately, it gets to be a turnoff for them. Love the mirror. Very simply, in a high collaborative relationship, in a high collaborative culture like this, very often there will be some conflict. Very often you can go home at night kicking the cat, screaming at your spouse or partner, yelling at the remote, because those knuckleheads at work just don't get it. In those situations, I would strongly advise you, before you get to the blame game, to look in the mirror and ask yourself what you're doing that's contributing to this relationship issue, that's contributing to this issue that's getting in the way of collaboration. Because ultimately, falling into the trap of concluding it's their problem is a losing game.
It's a losing gig. In fact, usually when there's a relationship problem, you're both contributing to it, or several people are contributing through it to it. So I would suggest you ask yourself that question and then ask the colleague, what is it that you're doing that's contributing to the problem? You'd be amazed at how effective that can be. Leading teams. Some of you lead teams, both officially and unofficially. And so, a good story to remember about leading teams is the story first about none of us is as smart as all of us. Yes, teams can take more time, teams slow down the process sometimes, but if you have the mindset that none of us is as smart as all of us, you usually get to the right outcomes. But the story that I think is most effective in understanding teams is a story about Michael Jordan, the famous basketball player, who was the rookie of the year in the 1984-85 NBA season. And Michael Jordan goes on to win the individual scoring championship, that is, scoring more points than any other player in the, in the league, in 1986, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, and 93. He's not a bad basketball player. <laughs> but the Chicago Bulls never won their first NBA championship until 1991. So an assistant coach said to Michael Jordan in 1989, listen, Michael, you can't do it all by yourself. You can't carry this team on your back. You will not win an NBA championship thinking you can do it single-handedly. Michael, there's no I in the word team. And Michael Jordan shot back in a flash. There is in the word win. Because to Michael Jordan, winning the individual scoring championship was just as important as winning the NBA championship. Implications for you all? You have to, quote, read the table. That is, you have to understand the motives and the agenda for everybody that you're dealing with on your team or the team that, in fact, you're interfacing with because no one's agenda is the same. So reading the table and understanding what the needs, motivation, and agenda are, will ultimately determine how they play together as a team, and you need to know that. And you need to know that, and you need to find that out by watching and listening very carefully. Because pe people's body language ultimately can tell you a lot about what their real motives are. Love healthy conflict. Too often in organizational life, conflict is considered evil. But the fact is, conflict's a lot like cholesterol. There's the good kind and the bad kind. And in organizational life, you want, you need to strive for debate and dialogue and discussion, which I suspect is not a problem here at, at Google. You don't want unhealthy conflict where people are vying for power based on personality or jealousy or unhealthy ambition, but you want dialogue and debate and discussion. This is the lifeblood of every organization. This is what didn't take place at General Motors for about 40 years. Leading bosses whether you think you have them or not, I have some bad news for you. Even in this very egalitarian, flat organization, we all have bosses. And an important story about bosses is really about the law of the emperor's wardrobe. The most important book ever written on leadership, 
until 2005. <laughs> You've all had this book read to you as kids. If you have children now, you have re read or will read it to them. You know the story, The Emperor's New Clothes. This book by Hans Christian Andersen, this fairy tale, was written in 1837. 1837. And you know the story about these two scoundrels masquerading as tailors. And they have this, what they claim is this spectacularly beautiful gold thread, which they convince the very vain king to buy, even though it's non-existent, explaining to him that only the most intelligent people in the kingdom will recognize how absolutely sartorially resplendent he will be in his new costume. And of course, he parades around town in the buff, you know the story, until at the end of the story, a child says, why is the emperor naked? Well, here's the message for you folks. From time to time, hopefully not that frequently, you're all naked. And very often, even in this culture, it's hard for people to tell you that they don't agree with your agenda, your priorities, your leadership, particularly if you have sanctioned power and authority and if you're senior. So you need to create a very safe place, a very safe environment where you make it easy for people to tell you when in fact you're not wearing any clothes. That's easier to do than the second part of the law of the Empress wardrobe, which is telling your bosses when they're naked. And in organizational life, when people ask me, what's the single most important requirement? I often demur because I'm not sure there is one, but I think one of the most important is to have intellectual courage. That is to tell bosses when they're naked, even when they don't want to be told that. I think at the end of the day, it takes guts to tell people what they need to know but aren't aware of. And I think for organizations to succeed, you need a broad cross-section of people in the organization to tell people that, to tell bosses that. I mean, for years, outsiders knew that General Motors had too many cars, too many products, a bloated bureaucracy. Everybody knew that except the people in General Motors, because nobody wanted to tell the bosses what they needed to hear. And I think the future of Google in a space as competitive and tricky and complex and fast moving as this is, requires people to have intellectual courage to tell senior people that there's some things they need to know about that they may not want to hear. Last law, and it's the law of values-based leadership. You know, you folks work hard, despite the game rooms and the free candy. You're expected to ship. You're expected to meet the targets. You're expected to do high-quality work. There's nothing wrong with that kind of expectation. And so it's quite likely that throughout your career, here or anywhere, you'll ask yourself, W-Y-H-A, what you have achieved? Because you're going to work hard, you have high targets to meet, demanding targets to meet. And one metric, one very appropriate metric, is to say, how am I doing? Am I successful? How am I doing against my business school classmates? But in fact, if that's the only metric you use, in my view, the slippery slope awaits, which is why I think it's particularly important to have another metric that you assess yourself against just as frequently as WYHA, and I think WYHB, that is what you have become to be successful, to meet the targets, is particularly important. 
What values did you have to suspend to be successful is all too often what ambitious people don't ask themselves. You know, the fact is, in my opinion, leaders establish this followership for two reasons. One, they're competent, because you want to follow competent people. But also, it's because of their character. That is, you believe in their values, you believe in their sensibilities, you can trust they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Because in my view, if, if leadership's about taking people with you, pulling people, if leadership's about building followership, then I think ultimately values are the oxygen of followership. Thanks very much for listening. I appreciate it. So if you have questions, please use the mic because we have people. Ah, listening. use the mic. Okay. We have one mic. Yeah. It's usually the first question that's the most difficult. So I think we should start with the second question. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to hear your advice on Hear my advice on delegating, okay? Um, well, you know, books have been written about delegating. And... Uh, <laughs> I hope you don't do that with my book. Uh, I actually think it's very simple. Uh, I think... It's very, you need to be very clear about what, you, what you're asking the other person to do. The second part of that is making sure he or she understands the reason that you're asking for it. I think you need to be very clear about the timetable involved so that the person is uh, on the same highway as you are about time frames. And I think the most important thing to do at that point is ask that person you're delegating to, what he or she needs from you to enable them to own it and be accountable and meet the target. Um, it often falls off the cliff when the person says, okay, I'll get it done, but isn't understanding about why it's important, how it connects with the cathedral you're trying to build, or is unwilling to tell you that there are several other priorities that he or she has that's going to make your timetable difficult. So it's very important to get, to get that granular information out during the discussion. So it needs to be much more than, you get it, I want it, it needs to be done by Friday. That's not effective delegation. Does that answer your question? Um, I had a question about kind of like can one bad apple spoil a whole bunch or can good leadership skills supersede someone who's possibly slightly toxic to an environment? Uh, yes, I think one bad apple can be very corrosive and toxic to a team. Uh, I think it's very important um, before you want to rent them over on Ninth Avenue, hiring a taxi to do so. I think it's very important to get to the source of what is it that's uh, causing this toxicity. Is it, I don't like my job, I don't like you, I don't like this culture, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do here, I don't think I fit in. So uh, I think, I'm not suggesting you need to be a psychiatrist, but I do think you need to get to the root cause of that. Some of those things are solvable. Some of those things are not. So if it's something you're doing or the team's doing that might change that attitude, you ought to try to do so, particularly if the person is talented and skilled uh, and valuable uh, technically. There are times where you're going to need to decide you're in, the wrong, you're in the wrong game. This is not the right game for you, 
and um, you need to get into a game where you're going to be more motivated, more comfortable, um, and a better fit. But yes, one person can can be um, can be very uh, dysfunctional to an organization and bring the entire team down. Sure. Yes, sir. You talked about a couple of things. You distinguished between management and leadership, which right. I absolutely get and absolutely agree with. You also said that um, motivation is really a product of leadership. And I'm, and I'm kind of surprised about that. And in, in one way, I'm surprised about that because I've certainly seen certain, not here, um, management have immense impacts on motivation, though not positive impacts on motivation. Um, and and I, I, in, in my experience, I'm in, in the same sense that some people are recovering alcoholics, I'm a recovering manager. Um, I, I've seen that both man, motivation can come from leadership, but I really think that I've seen leadership come from what you've described as management. Now, am I, does, does it, do you, in your experience, can it come from both? Is it really? Sure. It, okay. Sure it can. Sure it can. Um, and, uh, you know, there's nothing formulaic about being motivating and inspiring. But motivating this gentleman might be require a different set of skills than motivating this particular gentleman, which means you got to know who you're trying to motivate. You got to know what's going to ring their bell. You got to know what their agenda is. Um, and uh, I think certain motivation comes from sensible processes that prompt people to conclude, gosh, this place. Uh, is, is uh, reasonably well organized, it's, re it's got its act together, um, doesn't have too much freedom and too much iconoclasm. And um, consequent, and, and the other way around, and the nonsense uh, absolute, process. Abs and, or it can be so process driven that it's the eternal revenue service. Right, I mean, you're constrained. So, uh, yeah, I think we're in violent agreement, actually. Okay. That, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you use the example of inspiring people to build a cathedral rather than uh, than cutting stone. Well, those cathedrals took you know 150 years, so to build or more, so people were committed for life. Um, the reality of today is for generations. Yeah, yeah. But the reality for today is we'll hire you if you already know how to cut stone, and the instant we don't need you for cutting stone anymore, you're gone. Uh, so in that sense, in that sense is. You know, leadership in that direction, a noble lie? Uh, or not so noble. You sometimes. know, I think that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why uh, organizations have a very hard time eliciting high trust yeah. from the people who work for them. So I, 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 I do think that's, um, that's one of the dangers of, of, uh, of working in organizational uh, life today is that, you know, people don't have high trust for the, the institution. Um, so I agree with that. On the other hand, I think building a cathedral is particularly important. So at the time you're building it, however long you're there, even if it's not for Larry, Sergey, and Eric, and the other Huey Deweys and Louis around here, um, the fact is you think your work is meaningful and important, and you can go home at night thinking it's making a difference. It, it's, it, it's beyond the specific team or role you play, it, it's going to um, give you some sense of meaning and purpose, even if ultimately um, organizations uh, come to the realization that they don't need you anymore. For the time that you were here, so long as you can feel uh, you were doing something important, my hunch is you won't look like most of the people I see on the New York City subway system. Uh, this is a particularly interesting time to make that point because uh, if, in fact, you gain meaning out of your work, when you lose the job, you're in a lot of trouble, which has happened. Well, I didn't say you gain meaning from the work when you lose your job. I said you no, gain no, 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 meaning no. from your work while you're doing your job. Right, but then when you lose the job, what do you have left? Uh, the opportunity to find another job. Which, yeah. <laughs> right, which is a severe problem for people these days. Uh, it certainly so. is. It certainly is. Yes, sir. Um, First of all, thanks very much for uh, coming here and speaking to us today. Pleasure. I think Thank it you. was uh, terrifically informative and enjoyable, and I might even buy your book. Um, I have four kids, so we would appreciate I, so it. So I, I, I understand that problem, believe me. Um, I've worked for a couple of companies that uh, had naked emperors. Uh, I think that's great advice, but that's tough. Yeah, um, very And, difficult. of course, the reason it's tough is because often the messenger gets shot. Right. Uh, so 
how do you go about building that kind of culture? How do you go about doing that? How do you go about, if you feel that that has to happen, carrying out that yeah. task of, of speaking to the emperor? Because yeah. I think it's not, not trivial. But I think it's a great question. Uh, I think most organizations don't work up to their level of potential. Um, because most organ in most organizations, information flows down, and unfortunately, not enough of it flows up. It's so filtered and buffered when it goes up that um, bosses ultimately don't know when they're naked, which is why it's so important for an organization to understand when leaders are, in fact, um, naked or semi-naked. So you're right, it's very difficult. Um, courage is difficult, isn't it? I mean... Courage doesn't mean you're fearless. Um, fearless people are stupid, right? I mean, you, you know, going into battle in, in Afghanistan, Iraq, fearless gets you killed. So I, I do think that the, 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 what's tough about uh, courage is two things. One, pushing through the fear. But then to your point, having the kind of granular skills and emotional savvy to use the right language, to establish the right sort of covenants so that bosses ultimately know you're going to push back on them. Um, and uh, th there's a whole chapter in my book, chapter 10, about how do you push back? What, what words do you use? What, what language do you use? I, I'm not suggesting you go into a boss's office and say, I got to tell you, chief, that's really stupid. Or I got to tell you, boss, some people think you're a moron. Or I got to tell you, chief, no one agrees with your priority. That's not courage. That's stupid. But what I am suggesting is um, being artful, uh, clever, manipulative with the kinds of language and the kinds of relationship building skills that ultimately allows a leader to listen to your pushback. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have any questions in the remote offices? Guess not. Uh, thank you for everyone to speak today. Sure. I have a question. You may have covered it earlier in your speech. Um, I guess it has to do a little bit with perception, right? I think there are a lot of things with leadership that people take the boxes, and they're supposed to do this, supposed to do that. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, we talk about this a lot in circles, is people, they on purpose, but they need one. Uh, people confuse being liked with being seen as leaders, right? Yeah. Sort of the, this respect factor. Uh, can you comment on that and how how people sometimes get those two yeah. confused? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why you need courage to be a leader. One of which is you have to tell sometimes give people who work for you or with you some tough love, and um, often not met with uh, great popularity. So uh, I, I think it's I think it's important for people to respect you and your values. I think it's important to treat people with dignity and civility, but I don't think that's the same thing as being popular or well-liked, because being a leader means you sometimes you have to make some tough calls on people, you have to give them some tough messages. Now, how you give them those messages, I think is important, but I don't think that leadership has anything to do with popularity in the sense that you asked the question. In fact, it often takes, it's, it's often as difficult to give people, it's often as hurtful to tell people what they're not doing well as it is for the person to hear that they're not doing well. So I don't think leadership's about popularity. I'm not suggesting you need to be a shrink. I'm not suggesting you need to loan them money. What I do think is you need to tell people the truth. It's a great question. Yes, sir. OK, this is going to be the last question. Oh, boy. It's a pointed one. OK, uh, I represent the sales organization here uh -huh. at Google. And um, I was sitting with a few of my colleagues. And we remarked that, um, except for one or two, very few members of the sales leadership organization actually came to this session today. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you advise that we deal with that? <laughs> uh, well, I, first I, I would suggest you tell them what a fabulous talk they missed. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and then I think you ought to ask um, how come they weren't able to make it? And then you might want to say, do you mind? Because we have... We have this uh, this knuckleheads talk on tape, or a, we can, it's a link. Can we can we carve out a time to go through it? Because I think there was some concept he discussed that would actually help our group, our group, not you, but our group, 
be a heck of a lot more effective. Can we carve out some time to do that? Good advice. Thanks very much. Sure. Okay, it's 1 p.m. I think uh, that's about it. We're going to wrap up here. Thank you very much for attending the talk. Thanks for your time, everybody. Appreciate Thank you. It.